three years ago at uh, the steaming funeral events of Bumpus Hill, California, which many of you might have been to. It's just north of, of San Francisco here. And uh, as I mentioned in the, the morning talk, Charles Darwin wrote this very famous statement in 1871 in a letter to a friend. He talked about that some warm little pond somewhere with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts and heat and light, etc., uh, was where life could begin. Uh, but then the second part of this sentence is a little less famous than the warm little pond part. That a protein compound is chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. And he nailed it. This is what you need to do. You need to form a, a polymer called protein and grow it in length and in complexity. It's called today in 21st century science, uh, away from equilibrium systems. Amazing, amazing vision. And yet science for a hundred years went a lot down a lot of sort of rabbit holes, or smoky atmospheric rabbit holes. With, we had the uh, soups concept of Haldane and Oparin in the 20s through the 50s, and Miller Urey and their famous spark chamber experiment, which is the subject of all scientific horror movies. You know, it's got to be a spark chamber and stuff happening, uh, which uh, was very, very important as it launched our field because they synthesized amino acids from a reducing atmosphere. Uh, then in 1977, and remember these deep sea hydrothermal vents were found, and Jack Corliss suggested later that life may have started there, and that's been a deep sea rabbit hole that the field's been down for 30 years, uh, because in a continuous aqueous environment, things just break down all the time, and they, they diffuse, and there's no way to really get the system going. So Dave and I set out about 10 years ago, Dave, who you saw in the video, to bring the field back onto land, to bring it back to Darwin's warm little pond. And largely it is, is, has focused now. We've, we've made that paradigm shift in our field. So that's where the chemists are looking now. And at the same time, we have geologists. And one of the miracles of science always is that there's parallel discoveries. And in the same month in 2014, our colleagues at University of New South Wales discovered this geyserite uh, in a rock outcrop in northwestern Australia. And I have a sample of that here. And it was an, at the old sevens for a hot spring on the earth three and a half billion years ago for, that contained evidence of life, evidence of a rich ecosystem. So they found a hot spring uh, environment on the earth as far back as we can look. I discovered this along with Tara Jokic, uh, This The next field season, more stromatolites, these little red nodules. Then what we have here, let's bring this out, is a lakeshore stromatolite uh, that actually all this pass around, so you can feel it. This is actually the textures that are in this rock, thank you, that you can see here as you, as you pass them around, there are little ripples, and those are called fabrics, and that is evidence of life three, three billion years ago from a lakeshore environment in a mudstone. You can feel, put your fingers across the ridge and you'll feel that's our common ancestor. That's the sole story of life for 90% of the world's history, is microbial biofilms, kind of collectives of microbial communities, and they were, they were from which everything else issued. They cleaned our atmosphere, they, they gave us our oxygen to breathe, and they were the basis of which complex organisms could rise. They're the real story of life. And stromatolites, which are these, these sort of rocky towers growing layer by layer, still exist. There's some there in Australia. So if we go back to the Hadean Earth, this is a four billion years ago. We might find a hot spring environment like this on a rocky landscape that has an effusion of water that comes into something that sort of looks like Yellowstone on a regular basis. And the landscape is red because it's full of iron from those days. And you'll, when you handle this uh, wonderful artifact here, you'll feel the weight of it. It's full of the iron from the Earth's moon collision. So that's where our little engine of creation can start, as David was mentioning. And so uh, what you also heard Deepak talk about was Goldilocks zone uh, earlier this morning. And we believe that that carries to the landscape itself. So for example, up here you get 
stuff raining down, and this might be a little cool pool here that's not hot enough for chemistry to happen. And these streams, streams and rivers may be too dilute, and this may be too dry or too hot, but perhaps this pool with the hot spring is just right. It's the Goldilocks porch. And when you find the Goldilocks zone, you can cycle chemistry in it. So it's the optimal place for the chemistry of life to begin. And then when life starts, it would flow all across this landscape and end up in extreme environments, which one, one of the which is the ocean shore, with its salts and high tides and dilution. It's a tough place for life to exist. So it's really arguable that life could ever have started in the ocean. Uh, most chemists now don't believe that that's, a, that's the case. So on the land, you have all this power, you have this computational power, this adaptational power, cycling systems, concentration of little pools, adaption to many environment uh, stresses that the landscape gives you. It's a rich tapestry. So the ancient secret is the following. And you can try this in your bathtub at home. If you take uh, Bragg's amino acids, this won't be a, a very pleasant bath. <laughs> take Bragg's amino acids and you yeah, rub it all over your body. There's probably some cult that does the Bragg's bath healing modality. Maybe I should start it. Um, but you, you uh, put your bathtub soap in for your bubble bath with Bragg's and then you just lie back and let the, the top drain down. You'll have a sludge of, of, of this mixture at the bottom. And if you let that dry down, it makes a bathtub ring. will be mighty hard to get off later. Uh, but within the layers of the ring will be the chemistry you want to form proteins. Right in your own home, the safety, you know, safety and security of your own bathtub. So Dave actually, in 2010, built a machine to do this which has a little injector that hydrates a little dish, and then a little gas thing that dehydrates the dish as it moves around it. And he put in lipids, which are kind of like your, your bubble bath soap, and the building blocks of something called RNA. And they got sandwiched, this is a cartoon showing this, it got sandwiched in between the lipids as they were dry film, and formed polymers. And these are what are called gels in chemistry that show us that we're finding polymers. And this is a nanopore sequencing run. Our, our lab invented this technology to sequence polymers. So we can make RNA, we can make peptides, and now we're self-assembling DNA, <coughs> the informational polymer of life in this wet, dry cycling system. It's a huge discovery. It's one of the great discoveries of our time. So I, I said, Dave, we need to start doing this in liquid pools. And I trucked out to Yellowstone, to Buffalo Meadows. And this is a steep cone, studying the fantastic environment of where you start with no life at all, this super hot environment. And then you get this life that can live at higher temperatures and finally down to the photosynthetic life we're familiar with. You can see the history of Earth's life in one place in this way. And I picked up some water from this pool put it in with our mixture, with our Bragg's kind of bubble bath mixture, and shook it up, and sure enough, it formed little compartments that are shown as milkiness in the, uh, in the vial there. We did about 100 different ones, and we're able, through wet-dry cycling of the same Yellowstone water, to get RNA and DNA inside. And I'll show you how that works a little bit later. We tried it with seawater, and it crystallized everything. This is why you can't wash your hands in seawater. So it turns to curve. Another argument against an ocean over. It's just a case of weird science. Leading American scientist Dr. Bruce Damer is at Wilterdoer's Hell's Gate, conducting research trials aiming to answer the age-old question, how did we get here? It's very exciting. It's 21st century science, revolutionary science to watch. Uh, if we can find this cycle, it's the engine of creation, effectively. Also, that we're, we came not from an individual, not from competing individuals, uh, but from a network, a collaborative community, it was at the tap root of the tree of life. Dr. Damer's research could turn previous origins of life science on its head. He's testing whether hot springs on land may have been the starting point for life itself. Dr. Dan is searching for RNA, a nuclear acid, and the basis of all living cells. So that was last 
June of last year, we went out to another hot spring environment, Rotorua. This is called Hell's Gate. Many of you have been to the North Island in New Zealand. It's a wonderful place. And we did the same experiments in that environment. And you're some of the first people to see this result. This is what we got. Long chains of RNA, so long that we could image them with atomic force microscopy. A little string there. You can see all the little hairpins and turns and things like that. That's a piece of RNA, probably about a thousand units long. It's a breathtaking result. And we're now redoing this in the lab. We're redoing it on mica sheets in, in Denmark. Because when it is announced, probably next year, it'll be world news. So we can now show that we're self-assembling genome-like polymers now with wet, dry cycling. Now, the thing is, they're random. They're all random. Yeah, but they get inside these little bubbles whenever we rehydrate the dish, we get budding, and they get trapped in this lipid bathtub soap bubbles. But because they're random, you would say, well, why, well, how can that get you to life? Well, it can, because it's a big roulette wheel. It's a big Las Vegas gaming table, when you get a huge number of combinations that can be tested. So if you're all geeks in the audience and gearheads, you're all the self-selected gearheads, I'm going to show you a model by which you can write programs without a programmer. And I'll start with punched paper tapes, which is from the early primitive homebrew computers of yore, of the 70s, uh, going into one of my favorite computers, the Altair 8800, you know, right here in Silicon Valley, the homebrew club, powered by an energy source. These random paper tapes don't do anything, except there's a test see whether they turn one of those lights on on the front panel. By running through a simple CPU, they, all they get is, is tested. They either crash and the crash trash, they don't turn on a light, or they run, program A turned on one light. So we shove it back into the puncher and add a new program onto it. Now we get program A, B, turns on two lights. And maybe turns on the whole front panel over a long period of time through random selection of simple criteria, perhaps giving us a better PC by 1981, the IBM PC, one could argue if it's better or not. Um, <laughs> the laptop, after many, many years, and now your smartphone, and this is the evolution of software and hardware together. Uh, we pay engineers uh, a lot of money to be slightly better than this, uh, to use their intelligence and if-then-else statements. But this is the evolution, this is programming without a program. So where do you find this in nature? Well, you get your punch paper tape from stuff from space. And what I've got in my hand here, and you can, uh, uh, since we have time, maybe I'll just pass it around. This is the stuff I'm talking about. This is from 4.6 billion year old asteroid, a carbonaceous chondrite that we put in chloroform and dry it all down. You can see the little bits in there. And if you smell it, pass it around. You can smell the oldest thing you'll ever contact in your life, the smell of these basically uh, ring carbons, uh, aromatics, that we believe were falling on the earth because this, this fell on the earth and it's from that age of the earth, uh, which give you your building blocks. And those building blocks get sandwiched in between your layers, just like our bathtub example, made into polymers, which are our paper tapes, they go into a computer called D Charlie Darwin's Warm Little Cycling Pool. <laughs> they get run in things called protocells, and they either crash, they pop, or they do not. Through sort of a process called natural selection. The criteria here is not turning on a light somewhere. It's like, did you hold your container together, mm. or did it wobble apart? That's where we believe it starts, the evolution of software and hardware together. So this has all now been shown in the laboratory. The tri phase where we make those little bathtub ring layers and we make zillions of polymers. We add a drop of liquid back in and it makes these beautiful buttered off protocells. They get tested and then they wobble apart in the, the liquid phase. Then it dries down and we see a sludge of them at the bottom of the dishes. And they all are all jostling together and they can start interacting, they can start metabolizing. And they fuse then back into the dry phase and dump their polymers to get resynthesized or lengthened, just like Charles Darwin said we should we should look for. And this is called a progenote. This is a, something predicted in the 70s by 
Carl Lowe's and George Fox, the, the unit on the way to life, the, the unit that carries you from inanimate matter to living matter. So here at Alls is put together. We get our building blocks from space and other sources. We accumulate them on land and pools, concentrate them, cycle them through this thing till we get to the boot up phase of the living world. The sludges are then flowing and blowing all across the landscape. And now their early life, they have to learn how to lick the sun, basically, how to live from sunlight by this point. And then they spread all through the environment, forming the stromatolites at the green shore and lake shore and everything that you, you saw in the picture that we have that now the fossil evidence for. So that's the complete picture that, that uh, Scientific American, we call it the roots of the tree of life. The Scientific American featured this two years ago in a huge article that announced it to the world, this new model. And uh, it's now gone across science and being tested by many, many teams. Now, the, the interesting idea for us, the people who are interested in our personal spiritual philosophy, is that the origin of life is a common community, not a common ancestor. So the unit at the beginning of life wasn't a uh, competition or survival of the fittest between simple protocells, that was implausible. It was a collaborative unit uh, in cooperative uh, settings that could, was the only plausible unit for this to work. So the common ancestor is a common community. And that's a big philosophical role for our culture coming from science. So beyond that, what does this have to to do with consciousness. Well, if you can find the process by which life emerged from the background, of the sort of dumb background of physics, which isn't very productive. I mean, let's face it, the universe gets a D for productivity. It's, you know, 3.8 billion years, and it's the same dust, and the same galaxies, and the same dark matter and energy. It's not very productive. So something went wrong. Like, why is the universe not more inventive and creative? Uh, because it had to have a life to, to kickstart complexity. So how does that work? So if we're going from uh, physics to biology, what is this magic process? Really, in a sense, defining this process is one of the great discoveries of the next 500 years. And I think we're on the trail of it. And one night, I, I was, I'd been invited to the Science of Consciousness Conference and by Stuart Hameroff and Stuart Kaufman. And I said, I know not a clue about consciousness. But I do have Timothy Leary's library in my barn. So I went down there and I cracked open all these books on consciousness. And they were just words, words, words. I just could not connect with it at all. I had no feeling for it. I thought, I hope it's hopeless. You know, I know nothing, but I can't read all this literature, all these words, before June. So I did a thought experiment, which is what I usually fall back on. And I had a dream, a really, really intense dream, where the dream spoke to me and said, here's this undulating field. What do you think that is? I said, I don't know, like an undulating field? <laughs> <laughs> he said, push down on it and undulate. I said, some kind of physical thing. Yes, that's physics. That's pure physics. It's restatable, at least at the classical level. And then uh, opening into this field was this little dip. And I looked down, and it was my favorite thing, a protocell, a little compartment. But stuff had gotten trapped in it. So the dream said, what do you see? I said, I don't know what I'm seeing. And then it, and it showed me two divots, two little compartments, so stuff going between them. And it said, what do you see? And it said, beats me, you know, I keep going. Then it showed a mass of these things all together with stuff flowing around in a kind of a network. And then it put up these three Cartesian plots. So this particular dream being was like a super gearhead. <laughs> I'm a fan of, of Descartes. And it said, what you're seeing is probability shaping through crowding in a compartment, <coughs> internetworking or interaction through aggregation, through clumping of all these little units. And what happens next? So it said, what, you know, what happens next, buddy? some kind of a memory can emerge on this system. And in our case, it's little genetic polymers that start templating, start remembering things between cycles. And then the, the dream said, are you, are you sitting down? And I said, I'm lying down. He said, okay, get ready. And it blasted me with this thing. Bam. It said, this system, probability shaping through crowding, through association, interaction networks, 
and memory writing and reading is all you need to create all of reality that you sense. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, origin of life, but everything else, all of evolution, all the way up into human culture, all technology, spiritual experience, everything. There is nothing outside of the system. This is the, in a sense, the engine of creation. It's just turning and turning and turning and turning. I said, okay, um, how does this actually work again? <laughs> And so it said, uh, well, what, what this is, is like a new Copernican center. This is Copernicus, who predicted that the sun was the center of the universe at the time and would have lost his head or his funding if he published it during his lifetime. <laughs> but Galileo got into it and got in trouble. So here's the Copernican universe that changed everything about how humans thought about themselves, that there were other worlds. We were not just the center, we were just all this hubris. And so it was shown to me that like, your PIM thing, or this, this progenote, is the new Copernican center. I said, well, why? Because all of these things are tied to it. Everything generated by this thing. So an example would be this meeting. So you're here in the breakout session. You're crowded together. We're talking, or I'm doing most of the talking. But we're talking and passing messages around in a meeting. And then we remember things. Oh yeah, I remember what so-and-so said, or I'll write your email, or I'll take a video, or whatever. That's PIM. That's cultural evolution, or intellectual evolution. This is the sole driver of this whole darn bound thing. So we're now working with colleagues in physics to apply this into physics. Away from equilibrium chemistry, we're working with Google to take this inside rule to, to totally transform the way they do AI. Because AI is stuck in these terrible, deep neural network things that have to be trained and it's brittle and it's ridiculous. There's no biology in it, there's no evolution, there's no genes in AI. So we're now meeting with the office of the CTO every month to bring this formalism into Google to help it transform computing in the next 10 years or so. And I put it to you that it's in philosophy and metaphysics. I showed this to Ken Wilber uh, a year ago and he was like, whoa. <laughs> Because he likes the spiral thing, you know. He says, you have found the set point. This is the set point, the start point of the, where the, all the quadrants, all the holons start. So pretty cool. And perhaps it's our, the basis of our spiritual experience. So we start from the dumb universe, the dumb cosmos, that only knows on, off, on, off, on, off. Stars form, they blow up. You know, that's why it's so doggone un unproductive. It just doesn't, doesn't remember anything. Then we add biology, which adds memory third phase. It has a blueprint to do more stuff the next time. It's not the same old stars every time. Then, after a while, after several billion years, and it's in our system, we get neurons, which allow learning in the lifetime of an organism, which is a new thing. That's a new phase transition, fourth phase. Some of this came from Daniel Schmachtenberger, by the way. Give him some credit. Then, when you get enough neurons packed together, you get conscious awareness. You get awareness like I'm a being, and that's another being, and I look in the pond and I see, is that me? You know, that kind of thing. It sort of dawns on several species on the planet that, hey, there's, there's a world. <laughs> I'm an object in the world. So just getting enough of those neurons packed together. So the prediction I have is this PIM funny little dice rolling thing is the actual thing continuously generating all observable phenomena and all felt experience, but that collectively it generated something much bigger, much bigger than the primates can do. Like we're trained, we're, we're super visual. As Deepak was talking about, an earthworm, an intelligent earthworm would sense the world through the chemistry and, and touch in its skin. And, and these intelligent earthworms arriving in Earth orbit would say, well, uh, what do you guys do? How are you intelligent particularly? And um, the earthworms would say, you use optics? How could that be useful at all? You know, like, you're not sensing the world. You're not here. You're just getting photons and you're drawing geometries and stuff like that. It's like, how could you be here at all when your body's not slinking through soils and detecting every chem chemical thing? They would just be dumbfounded. You're not intelligent. You're just all dissociated. And we'd say, what about geometry, you know, and stuff like, what's geometry? But they got from the stars to us anyway without geometry, somehow, through their worm drive or something. <laughs> so anyhow, um, 
So I would suggest that, uh, you know, as Deepak was saying, although I don't agree with him, that there is no universe. I think there definitely is. And, and that's a bit of a dissociating kind of a, an approach. You kind of end up nowhere. Uh, I'll have a talk with him later. <laughs> We're supposed to meet and have, have a meal. Anyway, so here's the spiral that Ken liked. Physics, two phases. Biology, third. Learning, fourth. Fifth is consciousness, then where? So I posit to you that when we get to the point where we're not only just aware of ourselves as beings, but our whole world, we're aware of the field itself that was made. We, we then basically blur ourselves and get out of our own stuff for a moment, merge with that field, and it can happen in many ways, and there's many stories in this. And then we become aware not only of the whole field, and just kind of like for a moment, just let it take us over and show us stuff, but we're aware of our entire history all the way back, how we were made, and the totality of life. This is what happens. The being open to unity consciousness, really full unity consciousness. Where it's like it's also appreciation of, of all the little the little microbial mass uh, things in there, and the, the smells of that. Is that still moving around? So when as you smell that substance and realize that's what we're made of, our bodies are made of, and you touch those textures, you can appreciate all the labors that were done by these organisms uh, to make us. And you feel gratitude, humble gratitude. And I think that's part of this unity consciousness that can, just by going through the science that we know, we can come to this non-dual union. So here's a prediction of a tool you can use just as the early protocells shaped the probability for their survival by crowding stuff together and making better membranes and doing metabolism, perhaps our conscious mind are like protocells, and we can operate within the field that's now set up, this huge, massively interconnected thing, to shape probability. And I, I propose that it's our intention where you have a dream. I have a dream. I'm going to go to Burning Man. I need a ticket. And I, you know, I, vehicle pass, and it materializes. As always, you see all these reports that magically it came. <laughs> because you put it out there, you really, really want to go to the playa, and you had visions of being on the playa and everything, and it just happened. Um, attention means you pay attention, like that, that message went by, like so-and-so, as -so, a parking, as a vehicle pass, you grab attention, watch for it, and then actions, take actions. And I think that collectively that shapes this field for us. So, for example, if you want to go from the, the sucky present, I'm not going to the playa, to the glorious future, I see myself dressed up on the playa, um, and you want to traverse this probabilistic field, the little marbles and the stepping stones are going to roll down and say, here's a vehicle pass. Here's a vehicle pass. What's that? I have a vehicle pass. Oh, you do? <laughs> Come <on> down. <laughs> okay. uh, so, you can test this hypothesis over and over again. If my life is any evidence, the miraculous traversal of this probabilistic field in my life is just breathtaking. That's why this morning I told you the story of pulling down the veil and just naming the field and saying thank you and etc. Thanks for all the, the synchronicities. So all of this reality, just to get a little humble here, uh, is driven by one master cycler, which is the sun rising, or the earth turning into the sun every day, and showering it with this fantastic uh, spectrum of energy. It would have done the wet-dry cycling, it would have brought life into existence, it's still the master cycler. And if you took earth outside of the solar orbit, you'd see everything crash like really fast. So we are exquisitely dependent on this system. And so we shouldn't forget about that that we're not somehow some magnificent thing that exists on its own in the cosmos. We are dependent upon that energy coming in every single morning. It's that simple. So the origin of humans. So we looked at the origin of life and we got along, you know, up to these microbial mats which you passed around. There's a long time until you had fungi and then you had the animals, the plants, and then the animals. So as soon as, when you get to these guys, this is about maybe not, about 60 million years ago, the prosimians. This is the common ancestor of us. 
and they found a 55 million year old femur bone of a pro 